All right, so in this video, what we're gonna do is see how we can light an interior scene using a Redshift. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so here's our scene for today. Simple interior, I've actually used this a few times previously. I do wanna point out that I am looking through a Redshift camera and that'll be important later on because of the optical section here. Uh, and I also wanna mention that a lot of the techniques we're using will be applicable to other render engines like Octane, V-Ray, Arnold, all of that, as the process here is very similar. So I'm gonna start by creating um, a window for my Redshift render view. I do, do feel like it's a bit more responsive still than our perspective view. Um, and I'll go ahead and start this. You can see I had a daylight system in there previously, but I've now gotten rid of it. And so this is what our scene looks like without any lights in here. Now to start, we could use a daylight system or a sun and sky rig. We could use a dome light. Um, the approach would be similar. Um, just for this to keep it simple, I'm gonna use the sun and sky rig and that way everybody can use that. But with the sun and sky rig here, um, what's going to be important is kind of rotating this so we get some of the sun coming through our window. And that can be a little bit tricky depending on your scene. So um, what you want to do is just rotate it. Let's actually turn off the world coordinate system there. And we also want to make sure we lower this so we get some sun coming in through the window. And there's a little icon here which can help. Um, and honestly, we get out of our camera, we can kind of see how um, maybe something like that would be a little bit more useful, though obviously it would help if I was inside my room. So we'll give that a second to update. There we go. We can see kind of the sun coming in now. And actually what I'm going to do is get out of this camera, go to a top view, uh, and use that to maybe pull this camera back as much as we can. So that way um, we're able to look at this. Um, a little bit better. Uh, another thing I would recommend doing if you are kind of working on an interior scene like this um, is once you're happy with the camera position and you are obviously looking through it, uh, to right click, go to rigging tags and choose a protection tag so you can't uh, move it. Uh, now I'm not entirely thrilled with this view, but I think we can work with it at least for right now. Um, so we have the sun coming in through the windows. That's great, that's a nice touch. Um, notice though it's really dark, okay? And that's kind of a big um, part of lighting interiors is that it's you're not gonna get it as bright as you want just by adding the lights. There's going to be a secondary step. And that secondary step can um, happen in a couple different places, a couple of different ways. Um, but my recommendation is to get the sun in there, the sky in there, you know, position this light or your dome light really for kind of your shadows, the light coming in, you know, make sure you light like the angles of all that stuff. Um, because once you're happy with that, then what we're gonna do is create a portal light, okay? And that portal light will be placed right outside of our window. So if I come over here to my lights, I can choose a portal light. Um, and from there, I want to make sure, let's actually stop this. Um, I place this right outside the window. So perhaps going into something like a front view or a right view or whatever, orthographic view is going to work best. And just kind of size this so that it's larger than the opening. We don't want to make this too much larger because uh, for this to be as efficient and keep things as, um, keep our render times as low as possible, the, the better this is sized, um, the quicker things will render. Don't want to waste any time with that. That's looking pretty good to me from that view, so let's go here and then move this, maybe even a top view, and I'm using my F keys to switch between those. If you're curious how I'm doing that, something like that. And essentially what a portal light does is take light from our sky and force it through the portal, uh, typically into our environment, into our scene. Now, um, we're not seeing any difference here because really for that to happen, we need to adjust our exposure of value. Um, so as I start to increase this, we will start to see a little bit more light come in here through our window. Now, if we don't, almost makes me wonder if I didn't um, orientate this the wrong way, though I am seeing it here, but let's just rotate that 180 degrees. And of course, now we are seeing a bit of a difference. And just so we can um, kind of see that again, our exposure value is zero. 
Not really much of a difference as we are seeing before the portal light, but as we start to increase this, we will get we will see this brighten up as more of our sky, our light from our sky, starts to be forced in here. And the big important thing when it comes to lighting interiors is not necessarily the values you're using, your exposure value here, um, the intensity or brightness values in your sky, um, your sun, any of that stuff, okay? Because times in the past, I've increased the global illumination value in my sun, um, as well to help with that, perhaps even in the sky, but it's really the ratio um, between the values of our portal, portal light versus our sun and sky versus any other lights we might add. If there was a, a light, you know, if we wanted to add a light in this lamp here, you name it, okay? Because ultimately, how bright we get this is gonna come down to the adjustments we make in our camera or what, uh, in our compositing software, something like After Effects and whatever. Now, personally, I do prefer to do the final adjustments in After Effects. And so as I make adjustments here in my camera, or you could also add them in your post effects here, if you went to um, the optical controls, okay, uh, this is gonna get baked into our image. And so unless I'm absolutely certain um, I'm not going to go into a compositing piece of software, After Effects, maybe Photoshop to do any adjustments, then maybe I would do those final adjustments here, either in the Redshift Render View or my camera. Um, but I still like to start with these, make sure I'm able to get what I like. I like the kind of balance between the sun and sky and any additional lights, um, and then make my um, final adjustments in Photoshop, in After Effects. Um, whatever the case may be. So um, I'm actually gonna do this in my Redshift camera as I do think it's a bit simpler. Though, if you do want a little bit more control, something a little bit more photographic, um, that's really where you want to come in and use the optical section here um, in our Redshift render settings. So I know we're in the optical section here. What's interesting about the um, render view in the optical section is you get ISO, you get your aperture, things like that. Um, whereas in your Redshift camera, um, aperture really only relates to depth of field. So that can be a little bit frustrating, a little bit confusing. Um, and so why, um, if I wanted more photographic control, I would use my Redshift um, render view in the post effects here. Uh, though if I want something simpler, I'm going to go ahead and do it in my Redshift camera. Ultimately though, like I said, uh, I would do this in After Effects in Photoshop. Though I am gonna do it with the camera um, for you guys right now, just so you can see kind of my thought process and how I want this to end up. Okay, so I close those because I'm not gonna use them. Um, but now that I am happy with this, um, the one thing that's kind of a bit uh, of a bummer with this particular scene is I don't really have a nice background. Um, because when it comes to backgrounds, you really want to figure out how you want that background exposed because you really have two different options. Um, I have a background in here, or actually I got rid of it, never mind. Um, but what you'll see is if you were to kind of Google interior image, interior rendering, there's two approaches. There is the aesthetically pleasing approach where both the interior as well as the exterior is appropriately exposed. And the problem with that is, um, that's not what we see in everyday life. It's not what we see with our eyes or if we were to take a picture of an interior space. The other approach is the more realistic, though perhaps not as aesthetically pleasing, where if the room is bright, because obviously this is still really, really dark at this point, then the exterior um, outside the window in this case is going to be super, super bright. Okay, And um, that's the more realistic way of doing this, but it's not always, like I said, the most aesthetically pleasing. Um, but what we can do in here with our um, camera to kind of finish off this look is to use our exposure value. Okay, now this is the new Redshift camera. I do have a video about that if you wanna go through and learn more about it. Um, but as I said, I like this because it simplifies things. And we can see it starting to brighten things up here. Okay, so um, that's really nice that it's doing this. Um, and we're able to brighten up our image really without having to make any adjustments 
on the sun, the sky, the portal light, or any of our other lights. But what's important is the balance between those lights before you get started brightening this up, or else um, you're going to have a bad time, okay, and things won't look right. This is starting to look pretty good to me. We do have things that are starting to get maybe a bit too bright, a bit blown out, um, so we do want to be careful with that. Um, but, you know, an exposure value here of 3.7, maybe even bump this up to 4, is looking pretty good. Okay, now keep in mind, this is all happening through this camera. And so if I have additional Redshift cameras, like let's say I get out of this camera and maybe try and move around a little bit. Come on now, there we go. Something like this. And I create a Redshift camera, another camera, it's going to have uh, different settings, which on one hand is nice because you can set the optical values here as low as or high as you would like. Um, it is going to be different. So that is something you need to keep in mind. And honestly, I saw it update before it changed there. Whereas if you use the post effects here, this can be applied globally uh, to all of our different cameras. And so um, what we can do, why don't we actually just reset this um, and get started with this. Now, uh, full disclosure, had I switched the exposure type here to Filmic, I would have had access to the sensitivity or ISO. Um, but we still lack a lot of the controls uh, we would have um, in our optical section here. And so if I had to choose one, um, I'm personally going with um, our post effects. Uh, the Redshift camera is great. It's a bit too simple for me, okay? Um, if I am gonna do something, I'm gonna want a bit more control here. And once again, we can adjust the exposure value like we were doing previously, okay? Um, you can adjust the sensitivity or ISO. All right, that's a, all these are kind of film-based, photography-based settings. So depending on how familiar you are with these, this may make more sense, be easier for you to understand, okay? Um, and I'm just right-clicking and choosing reset to default. We have our at aperture as well, our f-stop, okay? Uh, and we have our shutter type, still movie, all right, which can be useful. This tone mapping section, um, is why I really like this because for the most part I can get you know the same values in this uh, optical section on the top part as I can in my camera but being able to choose how much of my highlights are crushed to white all right notice how when I set this to zero nothing is being pushed to white you can see how that's kind of like dull now we can even make this a little bit larger perhaps whereas I start to turn this higher um, more and more values get pushed to white that hundred percent you know, 255 um, value, at least in an, um, you know, not high dynamic range image. So you can see that, right? So maybe something like around 0.2 is working pretty good. I don't like checking on desaturate highlights. Um, same type of thing with our darker values here. We are deciding what values to crush to black. Um, you know, you can see as I turn this up, I do get a little bit more contrast. Uh, although, as I said initially, um, you know, I'm really doing this stuff in Photoshop or After Effects for the most part. We have our saturation, and then if you wanted to add bokeh, um, we can absolutely do it this way. But this is how you really, uh, you traditionally finish off uh, lighting and interior, is it's not just about the lights. Um, it's also about the exposure. It's also about the camera settings. And so um, I've tried to show you guys a couple different places you can do it, whether it's in the camera whether it's in your post effects, whichever you're more comfortable with, however much control you want. Though, as I've said a few times now, um, ultimately, I would say, okay, this is looking good. You know, I would turn off um, my post effects and then do it in my compositing software of choice, Photoshop, After Effects, whatever the case may be. Okay. So that will do it for this video. If there's anything else you would like to see, please let me know. And until next time, take care.